Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Way and Room podcast where we'll be previewing the first day of Aintree's Grand National Meeting and as ever myself James Mackey is joined by Frankie Foster and Paul Callahan to go through the seven race card. Afternoon gents, are we looking forward to Aintree's three day meeting? We are, big old week ahead. It's hard not to get, um, well you've got to get through the first two haven't you before you get to the National. I get excited looking at the National but yeah it's good racing on the final all week. Exactly. It, obviously, a lot of people say it doesn't compare to the Cheltenham Festival, but it's nice two, three weeks after we've got a lot of grade one action, yeah. as you say, the Grand National. Paul, is there any race in particular you're looking forward to on the first day before we get into it? Yeah, a couple of grade ones there. We've got an interesting four-year-old hurdle and the Fox Hunters as well. Absolutely love. Like, you can't beat watching, the, the, you know, watching them sail over the national fences. I was very lucky to have a, a spin out round there in 2007. I was very lucky to finish. I finished fifth. Horse was was incredible. And um, it was one of the best days, most memorable days in the saddle. And there's just there's nothing. I know Cheltenham's Cheltenham. There's a lot more pressure at Cheltenham, but entry is entry is something else. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So as I said, we'll be going through every race across the three day meeting. But today's podcast is looking at the first seven races on the first day of the meeting on the Thursday. And we're going to start off with the first grade one, uh, the grade one manifesto novices chase over two mile four furlongs, uh, a field of seven head to post this year. And we just discussed off air that this probably isn't the strongest grade one in the world to kick us off. And it's a, it looks very, very tricky, but because uh, there's so many different angles into the race, I think we, we might all be having different, different of, of opinions. So Frankie, We'll start with you uh, first. Who did you come down on uh, in the first? Well, like you said, there's many different angles, and I think, well, I mean, nearly all of them, but the top four in particular, you could make a strong enough, you know, case for all of them. And my selection really comes out of loyalty, James. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, for, for that reason, I, I couldn't make a decision. Um, Probably for me, between Pick Dory, Warlord and, and Gin Online, they were the most interesting of runners for me. Um, for people that have listened or, or seen on social media, Pick Dory's been the kind of horse of the season for me, especially on this podcast. So a selection out of loyalty. And I'm, I'm repeating myself as, as we look through his, his kind of form. But if you can discount when he took on Long Press and paid the price for it and came third then, and when he fell at Newbury, He'd nearly be stringing together about five or six wins over fences. And each time and each week we've kind of looked at him. It's always been the case. He's been a bit untidy. He's looked a bit chaotic, but he does bowl along. And I think that last race when he won beating Miller's Bank, things really clicked and he looked a lot more polished. And I think that's still not quite his best. And it's just, you know, for me, very, very solid. As I said, there's been a few... But he's he, he won. He would have won at Newbury if he didn't fall. He might have won if there wasn't no long press. And besides that, he's won every single other chase start. Um, so for me, he's just very, very solid. He's got better and better as the season's gone on. And there might still be a tiny bit left improvement in him. If, if Harry gave him a great ride last time. If he does something similar, he's got to have a chance. If, if I had to pick a nap for this first day, it would have been you picking Pick Dory. <laughs> thousand percent. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> yeah, you did. I had to. You did. So, so Paul, um, are you also in the Pick Dory camp, or are you looking elsewhere? No, I'm. I've looked elsewhere, and I can't. I can't make a strong enough case to take him on. I think he's solid. He's the highest rated in the fields. He's won three of his last four completed starts. As Frankie mentioned, he was a faller, unlucky to come down at Newbury. He he missed Cheltenham. The, the trainer Paul Nichols has specifically targeted the the entry meeting. So. Yeah, it's picked Dory for me. Like he's what round about the two to one ninety four mark now. Shortly after one forty five Thursday afternoon, that could well look a massive price. An alternative selection, one I tried to make a case for was Gin Online. I know he's a horse the connections like a lot, but he was a spent force until my Drogo came down. I know it was a match race at the when he was last seen at the the open meeting at Cheltenham. He's been kept fresh like like the selection pick Dory, but Gin Online is interesting. But even on a going day, I think Pictorial have, have too much for the, the lot of them. So, I, 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 look, lads, I completely understand your case for Pictorial. He's got a lot going in his favour. But 
when I looked at the race and I went through it and look, I could eat my words definitely if, if, if it's not how it happens. But I looked at the bottom of the market, Jack Amar, and I couldn't have him. I looked at Widowmaker, I didn't think I had good enough for Miller's Bank, I couldn't trust. Um, and then I looked at the four above and at the top of the market, Pictoria, I thought, you know what? Like, like you said, Frank, he's a very good horse and he's getting better. But before this season and slightly this season, his jumping's a bit suspect for me. And that's the reason why I want to take him on. Yes, he might be the highest rated. And, and, and some of these have got to find a few pounds with him. I just thought he was like, I would take him on. I looked at Warlord. I thought, if you look at his last race, he's arguably got some of the best form coming in off a of grade one. Yes, it's going up four furlongs. And he did stay on that day. So he might, might like this trip. I looked at Earn River. I thought he has done absolutely nothing wrong with its three runs. Um, but how good is that form? compared to some of these. So when I came down, going through the field, I stuck with Gin Online, like you mentioned, Paul. These connections really, really like this horse. And one thing that really, really got me to, to, to put my neck on the line for this horse was its record fresh. If you look at her, when she she had a lot of runs all during the in the summer last year and then finishing in November in that match race against My Drogo, where she was very lucky to win. I like she gets the mayor's allowance as well. Um, and I just thought in a race that yeah, I know, even though her, her best run today was probably two starts ago when she won the grade three and it's not grade one form, but I don't think this race is full of horses with grade one form. And I just thought getting that allowance, uh, I could see her going close off the back of a break. But again, we'll have to see because it's a very, very tough race, but I, ju I just, I would go for it for that reason. So moving on to the next race, uh, the grade one four-year-old juvenile, uh, juvenile hurdle over two mile one. Um, this is a race where I've looked at all week. Was it going to fall apart, wasn't it? Nine runners have gone to post. Paul, um, who did you side with? I'm looking to take the top two on, given that they've been to the festival. Like Pied Piper, Gardelius Charge, Davy Russell's back on board, finished third at the festival in the Triumph Hurdle behind Vauban. Brazil is interesting. I thought he was a good winner at the festival. He could be a bit of a, there's a, a, bit of a street fighter look about him. You know, he's tough, he's hardy. I thought he's, I think he's a bit more valued than the, the winning distance suggests at the festival. But the one I came down with is the John Joe O'Neill train, Petit Tonnerre. He's two from two over hurdles in France. I thought he made a pleasing enough start. He was a winning odds on favourite over hurdles on debut at Market Raising back on the 22nd of February. There is a bit of rain forecast. The most rain, I think, at the moment forecast is, is Wednesday. So Thursday might just be the softest ground of the, the three days. I think that will suit him. And I'm looking forward to see, seeing what he does in the future. I think he is a horse for the future. Um, John Joe Neal Jr. didn't have to get overly serious with him at market raising on his, his UK and stable debut. And just for a bit of value, I'm going to side with Petit Tonnerre. Well, I think another thing you have with the Aintree Festival is that when you see horses coming from the, like from the Chowna Festival, you don't know how spent they are from their runs. Exactly. And Petit Tonnerre obviously was supposed to be in the Boodles came out, didn't run, and been saved for this race in, in a way. 10 to 1, he could be the big each way value, couldn't he? Definitely. Like you said, Brazil's really interesting. Um, and there's other horses in there, like Salute, who's an interesting horse. But yeah, I think Petit Tonera 10 to 1 is definitely the value in the field. Um, Frankie, who, who did you side with? Unlike Paul trying to take the top two on, I was trying to decide between the top two. And um, I think it's one when kind of, Declarations start coming out, it'd be easy to just say, oh, Pied Pipe would be the obvious pick after being very well talked up in a competitive triumph. Um, he is my selection, but a, a tentative one and probably one I wouldn't have my own money on it, even money. Because Brazil is very interesting. I, I just had to stick with Pied Piper because Vauban was, you know, one of the horses of the festival for me. And I, I think Vauban was very, very impressive that day. And to come behind Vauban, I think, is strong enough form to win this race. But Paul touched on it quickly there. Brazil looked a bit of a fighter and, and Pi Piper didn't. Pi Piper was very stylish when he won at Cheltenham um, before the festival, but didn't wasn't asked to do anything. He just looked very, very good, you know, miles clear of the rest. He didn't find an awful lot when asked at the festival. And that does worry me. Because Brazil, on the other hand, did. Brazil really kind of battled up that hill. So there's not a lot to choose between the top two for sure. 
Um, Pied Piper's probably too short for a bet, but I think I'd kick myself if I didn't stick with the favourite off the back of that wall band form. So uh, Pied Piper's a selection, but I, I do think it's, it's short for a better even. Yeah, this is the thing. I was the same as you, Frankie. Even though I looked at others elsewhere in the race and did think there was probably value with like Petit Tonnerre, I was looking at the top two in the market and trying to trying to really get one of them beat against each other to see who's going to win. Um, for me, I came down on the side of grade one form over handicap form, um, and I'm just going to side with Pi Piper as well. I think if you look at its runs to date, yes, you're right in the, the triumph. It probably didn't battle as well as you wanted it to. And you probably then look at why David Russell went back onto Phil Dore instead of Pied Piper. David Russell's on today. I, I like Jack Kennedy. I think he's a great rider, but I, re I really like how David Russell rode uh, Pied Piper at Cheltenham when he won by nine, ten lengths. Um, the Vorban form, as you say, I think that's going to be special in, in seasons to go on. So yeah. I think Vorban's a really special horse. Um, and yeah, Brazil, I think, I think another thing from a, like a price perspective, because you get a Pied Piper went from 13 to 8, 16 to 4, evens into 8 to 11, drifted back out to even money now as we record. Brazil went from 4 to 1, 3 to 1, 5 to 2, now 15 to 8. I would personally prefer to back Pied Piper now drifting slightly to evens and Brazil at 15 to 8. That's just me personally. Yeah. Yes, it's not, as you said, it's not something you're going to lump money on. If, like if you if you don't want to, but and and for how, from how fragile the market is at the moment, but I do think Pied Piper, even though only one pound high in the ratings, probably a better horse at this moment in his career than Brazil. But again, it's another one we'll have to take time. I think to what tell, you said, but... what what you said there about Grade One form versus handicap form is quite key, isn't it? You've got a Pied Piper finishing behind Vauban, or you've got Brazil being a well fancied Gaelic warrior, but in a handicap, and it was only well fancied because. They were astounded at the market got given. So, yeah, grade one form hopefully pulls through. Exactly, exactly. So, we'll move on to the third straight grade one uh, on the card, and it's the Betway Bowl over three mile, one furlongs. Always a great, a great race. And at the top of the market, Clanders Oboe's last winner, uh, last year's winner, um, up, up against the young pretender and protector at, and you've got Conflated, Kenboy, El Dorado, Allen, Rolf for Guy, Bristol Demai, etc. Um, Frankie, we'll start with you on this one. Who are you looking at? Probably is like a value pick. This is a bit a bit wordy, so you'll have to bear with me. But I was looking at, uh, at horses that have ran at the festival. But, you know, as Paul said, you, it's definitely an angle to take a horse that doesn't go to the festival and come straight to entry. And especially the further they go, and you've got horses coming out of Gold Cup coming into, into this race. I think that's very, very hard to do. So I was having a look at what's ran at Cheltenham and what hasn't. You've got Protector at third in the Gold Cup, Conflated, looked tired, I thought, at Cheltenham when falling in the Ryanair. Eldorado Allen, third in the Ryanair, Royal Pagai, fifth in the Gold Cup. There are a lot of the ones that have come out of Cheltenham. Kenboy is the one that I like that hasn't gone to Cheltenham. And if you look prior to that, when he ran in the Paddy Power, the Irish Gold Cup, Conflated won that race, but I think just by brilliant ride from David Russell took lengths out of the field and just kind of kicked on so let's ignore conflated in that Irish Gold Cup and you've got Manella Indo in there in second who comes second in the Gold Cup you've got Janadil in there who came second in the Ryanair you've got the craziest steering for long and then you've got Kenboy so ahead of Kenboy in that race his last race before coming here you've got the second from the Ryanair and the Gold Cup at the Cheltenham Festival which aren't turning up here and the horses that have gone to the festival haven't beaten either of those. So off the back of kind of that form, plus the fact that Kenboy hasn't gone to Cheltenham, I think he's got a real good chance here. And Willie Mullins, as we know, is, is a genius at, at doing this and, and placing the way he wants. So I think he'd be coming here in great form. No, I think you make a really strong case for Kenboy. Yeah, Kenboy's always been a horse that I've really liked. And if you actually look at the last time he ran at Aintree, he won. So he has got course form as well. Um, Paul, was Kemboy your selection as well? Yeah, he is. I think he's, as for the reasons Frankie mentioned, he's, he's made a solid case from there. I tried going to, I had a look at Clander's elbow, but he needs to bounce back. He was well beaten at Newbury last time out in the Denman chase. But as, as Frankie mentioned, for the points Frankie mentioned about Kemboy, you know, he hasn't been seen since his run in the Irish Gold Cup. He won this race back in 2019. A bit like Nick Dory, he's a horse that likes to roll along in front. And I think that's going to be, he'll get into a rhythm on the Paul Town end. And I think that will pay dividends here. And I think he, he put it up to them. 
yeah, like you said, I, I think you, you both made really good cases with Ken Boy, and he's a horse I do really like. But on the other side, I've gone for a different horse. I've looked, I've gone for the young pretender, I've gone for Protectorat. And it's very strange, isn't it, when you look at different races, because at Protectorat, I saw a lot of people putting him up for the Gold Cup, and I couldn't have him at all. And I look at this race, and I just think, I think he's got a really, really good chance at 7-2, to two, currently, like at time of recording. This seven-year-old against, apart from some of them in the field, pretty much older horses, especially above him in the market. But he was an accomplished hurdler. He was a brilliant novice chaser. And he's gone on to this season to be a really good staying chaser. And I think he's going to progress throughout his career, only being a seven-year-old at the moment. You're going to see him definitely, hopefully, all being well for a few more seasons. But if you actually look at his three runs this year, and even though his results might not say, I, he looks to me like he's getting better and better. In the Paddy Power Gold Cup, when he was second of 19, behind Midnight, uh, Midnight Shadow, who's gone on to pass away, unfortunately. But the way he stayed on that day over the two mile four was really, really encouraging for his first run, giving seven pounds away to the winner who looked well handicapped that day. You then look at his run at Aintree over the course and distance in the Mendy Clouds chase. Went up to absolutely blitz up by 25 yards. Yes, Native River, Sam Brown, two amigos in behind him. Not the same form as this race, but he couldn't have won any easier. And you've only, you can only beat what's in front of you. But then you look at his run in the Cheltenham Gold Cup, and although he was beat very well by A. Plutard and uh, Manella Rindo, Galvin was staying on, Rulpa Guy was staying on, and Protectorat just stayed on much the better of them. And I really, really liked how he did that day. Hopefully it hasn't taken as much out of him uh, as people might might have thought it might. But I just think he's got a really, really good chance. And he was in a three to one. He's now drifting to seven to two. If he drifts even more, I'd love it even more because I think he's got a really good chance. And one thing I also like, like we mentioned with Ken Boy, who was already a winner uh, at Aintree. If you look at Protector Act's form, he's two out of two um, at Aintree, winning in the many clouds. And then last year at this meeting in the manifesto. So I, I, I'm, I'm just really fancy Protector. And I think he's got a really, really good chance in this race. But again, another tricky one, uh, and we'll see. So the final grade one event on the Thursday is the entry hurdle over two mile four. Only seven runners again go to post. Um, I thought more runners might have stayed in, but only seven have stayed in. Paul, who are you siding with in this one? This was tricky, I thought. I thought, anyway. I thought Epitante yeah, comes... I, I thought so. I thought yeah. so as well, I thought really tricky you know you, you have the Cheltenham form Epitante second at the, the festival Zana here third last time out the one I, I did look at was brewing up a storm the second one last seen Ollie Murphy's charge Sean Bowen takes the mount is a course and distance winner however the, the one that I came down at is a bit of an old favourite of mine it might, so much so that my predictive text on the phone as soon as I put the MC in came up in the <laughs> <laughs> that's how much I like them <laughs> He did struggle in this race last year. I'm going to take a chance that Harry Cobden has made the wrong choice here. He was last seen not staying the three miles behind Paisley Park in the Cleve Hurdle last time out. He was an on-runner in his intended engagement at the Cheltenham Festival. And I think that will work out in his favour here. Lorcan Williams takes the mount. So at a bit of a price, it's McFabulous for me. When he's good, he's very, very good. Yeah, he's very much a travelly thing, isn't he? Um, yeah. McFabulous. <laughs> and, and over two mile four, two mile five, it's his perfect trip. Whether he's good enough, even though this company is probably not the strongest, whether he's good enough to win a grade one, we'll have to see. And that's probably why he's 14 to one. But if, if you get behind a horse for a long time and you want to go and see him just do that, <laughs> I, no I, can't, I can't leave him <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know where it's from. Um, Frankie, who did you come down on? Yeah, I think the most fabulous with the, at the prices is a nice little. Um, shot for an outsider. I just thought that Epiton and Zanahir ran really good races in the champion hurdle. I know everyone's banged on for a long time about it being a weak champion hurdling division or weak hurdling division and you know Honeysuckle's had her way because of that. Honeysuckle looked as good as ever and these two in behind that I thought they were impressive. Um you know Honeysuckle is unbeaten and an absolute hurdling great and in behind these two were not disgraced by any means and I've, I I spent the prep for trying to pick a winner in this race essentially watching that champion hurdle back about 10 times trying to figure out which of the two I'd, I'd side with and I, I think I'll stick with the favourite Epiton especially given 
the the kind of talk of her back surgery and how she was coming back to her best. And I think maybe there might be a little bit more um, improvement, if you could call it that, you know, coming back to her best. Maybe there's a little bit more left in that. She made a bit of a mess of the last, which didn't play in her favour and still managed to stay on for second. So out of those two in, in what I think were both impressive champion hurdle performances, I'd probably um, s- stick with the placings of Epitomp 1 and, and Zana here too. So do you, I'll ask you the question. Do you, do you think Epiton will get the two mile four? Do you think, do you think she'll stay? Because that, that's, I think that's, that's the big question I've had with this race. I love Epiton and I loved her performance. How, how she was 18 to one when you look at that performance of the champion hurdle yeah. was mad really. Um, and Zana here was in, in behind her that day. But do you think she, she properly will get the two mile four? That's the question. From the way she finished the race, you'd like to think so. It's it's a big question because it, why why do it now? I kind of I kind of wonder why why do it now? What is the reasoning for it? Is it a last ditch attempt? Is it the best place to try and find a winner at Aintree? Are they trying to take advantage of her being in good form right now? Um, many questions, but she looked as good as ever. She finished her race well. She's a class act over hurdles, so it is a question mark. But I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to give her that chance. I think no, if she's, uh, I think yeah, if she's, Paul, I think if she's going to get two and a half mile, I think entry would be be the type of track a flat two and a half mile. It's an easy two and a half as opposed to say the likes of Doncaster or Newbury. You know where where it'd be to be quite a stiff gallop in two and a half miles. You know. Uh-huh. Yeah, no. I, see, this is the thing. I looked at the race, and I didn't. I wasn't of the opinion that she wouldn't get it, but I was of the opinion that Zana here would get it better than her. Yeah. Um. I, I I truly do think Zana here has been crying out for this trip, and I think next year will be a horse for the stairs hurdle. I think he wants even further. Personally, for me, look, we'll see what Gordon does with him over next season. But I think this is the race he's been crying out for. He's, like, like Frankie said, that these two ran brilliantly in the champion early. He has, he has got to reverse that form with Epiton. But if you look how he's progressed as a juvenile, winning grade threes, grade twos, didn't do it at grade one level twice. Uh, but I can let him off for that because now, what, five years of age, he, he's a bit of a different horse. And the way he finished his races this season, like I was at the Dublin Racing Festival, and the way he finished his race behind Honeysuckle, he finished race even better at Cheltenham. I just think he's when he gets that chance to travel a bit further before he has to, what Jack Kennedy will say, go on, have a go. I really do think this is exactly what he wants. Um, does he reverse, reverse the form? We'll see. But I think he deserves his chance over this trip. I think he's got a really, really good chance. So a horse, um, sorry, a race that Paul alluded to was one of his favourites he's looking forward to on the first days. The next we're going to cover, it's the Fox Hunters Open Hunters Chase. Um, Paul, we've obviously got to start with you in this. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really tricky, tricky race, but very exciting. So who, who are you going for? Oh, it's a belter, this one. I love it now. Um, you have Cousin Pascal is, is looking to, to win it for the second year in succession. Jess, Sam Whaley Cohen has a, has a terrific record over these fences. But Will Biddick, another rider, I'm a huge, huge fan of. Um, I think he's one of the best either side. He, was, he turned professional briefly back in the day he rode a Cheltenham Festival winner for Venetia Williams but I think he stands well over six foot tall he's quite broad shoulders on him so obviously weight got the better of him so he trains and rides Porlock Bay who was formerly trained in France by Francois Nicole he won the Hunter's Chase at the festival last year under Larkin Williams he was a beaten favourite at Bangor on seasonal reappearance but I thought he looked undercooked on that occasion he got a bit tired in the closing stages I thought he ran well to a point if you pause the race at the last fence you'd be quite happy with him but on the television watching it, I did think he, he just looked to, to carry a little bit of condition. And I think we're going to see him to, to good effect. And Will Biddick, I don't think he's ridden a winner off the top of my head over the national fences, but his record is quite good good on getting round there. He's got round on, on the majority of his rides. So touching all available wood, I'm not putting the markers on him. And I'm going to side with, with Porlock Bay. Uh, Paul, I'm in exactly the same camp as you here. I think Porlock Bay, um, at the price, is currently 8-1. to one. I think he's got a great each way chance. Like you say, his win at the festival last year, I was very surprised not to see him go to the festival. But when you actually look at his ride, he might have just need a bit more time and they might have gone right. We'll go to Aintree instead. We'll give him a bit of a different challenge. It's a bit of a lesser trip. Um, I think he's got a really, really good chance. Um, so I'll be sticking with you on that. Another one I will put up, 
a bigger price, about 14 to 1 at the moment, is Maracuja for Dan Skelton. Uh, look, this horse has still got a lot to prove, but he, it, it seemed like to me that Dan Skelton was absolutely lost to do with, with him this, this season. One on seasonal reappearance, but after that, ran four times to no form whatsoever, running in a class five at Hereford, and it just still wasn't winning. So then they've gone and shoved it into uh, a hunter's chase at Leicester. One by eight lengths, back to its best. He might just need something like this to get his form back, get back to his best. Um, and I thought if it was exactly what he wanted and he ran to a similar level as, as how he could do, I thought 14 to 1 was quite big. And the way Dan Skelton's coming into the festival, 28% strike rate at the moment, and Tristan Durrell, who's on board, is currently running at 38% strike rate. I just thought 14 to 1 was definitely worth a chance if getting back to the horse it was for coming into Hunter Chases. Um, Frankie, who did you come down on? Late Night Pass, who was behind your Porlock Bay or in fourth place um, when he won that day at the festival. And um, I think that's the, the key for me in this race. They had a crack at this race last year after going to the festival and coming fourth. This year they haven't. It's been having a lovely time point to pointing, winning by about 20 odd lengths, come straight to entry. And a year old as well, I think that might be the key here. And that horse must have some improvement left. It was only, I think it's just checking now, a nine-year-old now. Yeah, so only eight years old when going to the festival and this race last year. Um, as I said, it's been point-to-pointing, has had a lot of a, a, an easier season than they did when they came here last year. A year older, a little bit more of a mature horse. Um, and hopefully that will be the difference, just a bit fresher um, targeting this race rather than Cheltenham and um, might be able to go one better. Yeah, I think the Fox Hunters is a great race for looking for value, isn't it? And I think with the horses we mentioned, let's let's be hopeful if they jump well, we'll get a run for our money, really, with, with the form they have behind them. So the penultimate event on the Thursday um, is a really, it's an, another tricky race. The Grey 3 Red Rum Handicap Chase over two miles. Competitive field, as it has been um, for many, many years now, uh, Paul, again, we'll start with you. Who, who did you come down on? I found it hard to oppose the Sam Thomas train before midnight, who was second behind the Venetia Williams train, Funambul Savola, who's rated 166. That run was that was last time out at Doncaster at the end of January. He was only beaten a length by the winner. I think he dead heated for second. The highest rated in this is 153. He won a couple of decent handicaps at Cheltenham and Ascot last season. He's If he can run, if he can hold that form of his last run and Indeed, build on that. He has to be there, thereabouts, as the price reflects. I know he's, I think he's towards the, the bet, top of the betting at the minute, James, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Six to one currently, I'm looking at, yeah. Yeah, I think he's he's my selection here before midnight. Frankie, who did you come down on? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. I think it, that form with Funambo Savola, often unchanged mark, I think, of 148 coming into this race when, as Paul said, if you look at what that horse, Fernando Savola, has gone to do since, won a handicap at Newbury, then went on to run the festival, is rated in the 160s um, and finished, you know, close enough battling for second behind, going off of 148 here. And that was the last bit of work that before, or the last race before midnight's running, has to have a chance, has to have a very good chance. Well, it's about time this happened, isn't it? We're all going for the same <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> It seems too good both, to be true, this one. <laughs> uh, oh, it does. It does. It, like, for, for the reasons you both said, um, and personally, I still think of 148. I still think he's, that's a workable mark for this horse. I think very, very progressive. The the, the form, as you said, uh, behind the horse who was second in the champion chase, that you, don't, you can't ask for much more, really. And being pulled out of the grand annual being a bit more fresher coming to age than maybe some of these horses. You look at Global Citizen who run the race. The absolute ground was attritional. Um, I think he's got a really, really good chance. Even at 6-1 to one at the moment, you'd still back him each way, get, getting extra places uh, with different bookmakers. I think he's got a really, really good chance. One I will just put up, if it was to rain, I'm not. we don't know the forecast. I'm seeing very different forecasts at the moment. Some with a bit of rain coming before, before the Thursday, some not. But if the rain was to fall again like he did before the Cheltenham Festival. Frero Bamboo has definitely got to have a really good chance. He's a really, really consistent horse. He's third in the Grand Annual. In that attritional ground, was very good. Uh, at Lingfield, it was heavy again, um, and, he, and, and he won re- really quite well. And then before that, he went to Sandown, and in a race that Dolos makes his own, um, he got really close behind him. 
I think only up a pound higher than he's running the Grand Annual. If it was to rain, maybe be soft ground, I'd definitely put him up. But my main bet in this would definitely be um, before midnight. So I think he's got a really, really good chance. And if he runs to the level that he should do and the form he's got, it'll be very tough to beat. So the final race um, on, on the first day is the grade two mare's bumper. And every year, this is ridiculously tricky. You might as well just throw a dart and have a go at it. But we're going to try and find the winner off form. Frankie, we'll start with you. Uh, which mare did you land on? As you said, it's uh, throw a dart. And often I'm looking for trainers rather than, than horses in, in these. Um, Mullins or, or Fergal are the two that always stand out in a bumper, especially this season. Fergal O'Brien's been banging in winners in bumpers and, and that's where I'm going to settle. Mullins in the bumper would be too obvious with a favourite, wouldn't it? <laughs> it probably is only favourite for that reason. Um, but at, go on, as we look now, seven to one leading theatre for Fergal O'Brien, second in the bumper behind Bonte at Cheltenham. Um, looks good enough form. It's one of the highest rated, if not the highest rated in the field. As I said, he's been training plenty of, of bumper winners and I think that Cheltenham form is fairly strong and, and, and ran, ran a good race that day. So for me, leading theatre um, at around seven to one is where, where I'd have a, where I'd be trying to land my dart anyway. Yeah, Fergal O'Brien's bumper record this season has been absolutely remarkable. I can, and if, if, it's, if it's not, if you don't need fixing and you ain't broke, you've got to go with something <laughs> like that. Haven't you? So definitely uh, in with a chance. Paul, who did you land on? I'm just kind of thinking if we could take five each. There's 20 in the ring. <laughs> if they cover, we should have a winner amongst us. <laughs> um, I think Rachel Blackmore, she rides the horse. She's on Lady, Lady Dalibor for, for Alan Jones. I know Alan Jones has certainly talked his mare up and he was keen to get Rachel on board. Gavin Cromwell is Law Ella. He's the services of Aidan Coleman. Law Ella ran out an easy winner of a bumper at Down Royal on St. Patrick's Day. I'm going to stick with the, well, the one I've gone with is the Lorna Fowler trained Naughtiness. Tom Hamilton takes the mount. Naughtiness was second at the Pontestown Festival on debut last May. Won a bumper at Fairy House on New Year's Day under Tom Hamilton, despite being caught out wide throughout. The third, Clark Kent, has since won a bumper at Clonmel. That was, I think, possibly St. Patrick's Day. The Yard are doing well. Lorna Fowler is doing particularly well with, her, with the numbers she has. The Yard are doing really well this season. Even the horses that aren't winning are still... You know they're running. She's getting places out of them. So for that reason, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with naughtiness. Yeah, uh, definitely with a chance. Um, definitely with a chance. The one I'm gonna go for is one you mentioned at the start, Lady Excalibur. Um, I, I like a lot of what's going on with this horse going into the race. As you said, a trainer Alan Jones has taught this horse up a little bit, and his price has her price has retracted slightly before that. But I still think at twelve to one, it's a really nice each way price. The five-year-old's been seen three times, winning twice, not finishing uh, outside the top two, placing on another occasion. She's a 100,000-euro daughter of Camelot. So a pedigree, it's, it's very smart when you look at it compared to some of these. She probably has that edge on pedigree. Um, and obviously, the booking of Rachel Blackmore for the first time, I, I was reading an article in the Racing Post, and it, it, was, it was basically saying they wanted to get Rachel to ride her at Stratford on her debut, but she was injured at the time. So they've always had Rachel Blackmore in in line to ride this horse and what better time to do it at entry in a grade two. Um, I, I just thought a 12 to one, like you say, it's a bit of a stab in the dark with some of these. We've only seen them once or twice. We've seen this horse three times. She's got better and better with each run. And e even though her second was probably falsely run race slightly, I thought she did plug on well, but got much better uh, next time out. So Lady Excalibur for me uh, in the lucky lass. So lads, that's the first day covered. Thanks so much for your insights. But I'm going to ask you for your nap on the oh. first day uh, of the meeting. It's tough, but I'm going to ask you for who do you think is your best bet? And go on, Frankie, we'll start with you. Uh, who's your best bet on day one? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'm not, I, can't, I can't nick before midnight. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to stick with Pick Dory. Why not? <laughs> this whole, I think every time I've napped or we'll put this horse up as a selection and napped it up, it's won. So it's, it's done me good. It's made me look like I know what I'm on about. So I think I think he can do it again, as we said at the start. Um, has the best form, in my opinion. It's the highest rated. Can be a bit quirky, but he looks to have kind of ironed out a few mistakes this season and picked Dory for me. If you wouldn't have gone pick Dory, this podcast would have been cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Paul, who's your nap? Yeah, anticipating Frankie was going down that route. Um, <laughs> as much as I'd love to see Will Biddick ride a winner over the national fences, poor luck Bay, I'm swerving him for the nap bet. The nap bet's coming in the bet fair in the bowl. I'm going with Ken Boy. Winner of the race in 2019. Loves to bowl the long in front. He'll get into a nice rhythm under Paul Townend. Hasn't been seen since the beginning of February. And I'm with Ken Boy to, to put it up to them in the 255. Yeah, so I, I was I was two and off round with two, but because you've gone for the Betway Bowl, I'm gonna go for the four-year-old juvenile herd, and I'll go with Pied Piper. Currently, even money, I think only I know only a pound higher than Brazil, but I think under David Russell back on board, um, hopefully he can get the job done. So, lads, thank you so much for that first day preview. Please be sure everyone to like this video, subscribe to the Wizarding Clover channel. With all three of us back for two more days after this, looking at the uh, day two and day three. So, lads, cheers again. And hopefully we've picked out some winners for the first day, which is why it's a very tricky card. So, cheers, lads.